start. So we are at the, the top of our session number two, uh, focusing on data systems and services at EarthCAM and ASPROMAT. Uh, Brennan already referred to EarthCAM a couple of times in his presentation as a, a resource for data. So we wanted to introduce you a bit to the content of the data systems, to uh, procedures, how to get data uh, from these systems, but also talk a little bit about how to contribute uh, to publicly available geochemical data. And that's where the policies come in uh, only on one slide though. So I think um, many of us are aware that there are quite uh, a number of challenges to data science and geochemistry. And the most important is that it's hard to get to the data. Uh, historically, geochemical data have not been shared uh, very openly. They have been mined, mostly um, made available through the scientific literature and uh, that has limited accessibility and also preservation. Uh, in general, the geochemistry community has been slow to embrace the need for global standards um, that are actually needed to get data into uh, databases, into data systems that then make this data easily accessible or to integrate data compilations from different places. There is unfortunately still a bit of a culture in geochemistry of hoarding data. And uh, my good colleague, Leslie Wyburn from uh, Australia calls it data mining uh, in just emphasizing that people try to hold on to their data. But I think uh, things are really changing. And part of it is the fact that the the volume of geochemical data is rapidly increasing and just the participation in this workshop today shows that there is a need for better uh, data access. And I think that a new generation is taking over who will share their data in a more consistent format. So um, what we see basically at the moment um, is, is many, uh, frustrated data scientists who feel that there is no data available that they can easily work with. We have though um, for been more opening up science, opening up scientific results. Uh, everybody is familiar with open access questions for published, um, published uh, scientific articles. Uh, but the open science movement also um, focuses on making data software methodologies more openly available in order to make science more tra transparent and accessible. Get on here. So policies have actually increasingly been put in place uh, by either funders and by publishers to um, encourage the sharing of data or other resources. And as a, an example here, I'm showing an excerpt from the US National Science Foundation data sharing policy, uh, which expects investigators who receive funding from the NSF uh, to share their data but also physical samples, collections, and other supporting materials such as software and so on to share that uh, at no more than incremental cost and within a reasonable time. Uh, the other um, change in the landscape has been uh, on the side of the publishers who are also concerned about transparency and reproducibility of uh, research that they publish they had for a while already requested data availability statements and there are new author guidelines uh, that I just wanted to briefly um, talk about in a later slide. Uh, but nevertheless, even though we have this movement of open data, um, it is still kind of frustrating to see that 
uh, only 65% of researchers in the last year reported that they curated their data for sharing. This is a survey that Springer Nature and Fixture and Digital Science uh, have um, been doing on an ongoing basis. And I encourage you, there is a, the State of Open Data 2020 still open uh, to fill in if you are sharing your data and where the main obstacles are. Uh, in the last one, it clearly shows there's a big concern about misuse of data. Um, people are unsure what copyrights or licenses apply to their data and they worried that they will not receive appropriate credit uh, and be acknowledged for their data contributions. On the other hand, uh, there are motivations for sharing data and that is that actually uh, your research will have a bigger impact and visibility by sharing data. And we do have evidence in the meantime through statistics that has been collected that those publications that made their data openly available uh, primarily through re data repositories uh, have a higher citation rate than the uh, papers that don't. Um, there is clearly the benefit uh, of uh, for the public in sharing data and that motivates people to do it uh, and to get proper credit for it. But open uh, has clearly not been enough. If data are openly accessible, it doesn't mean that we can easily find them, that we can actually access them, and that they are reusable. Uh, and this has led to uh, a set of principles put together as fair, uh, whereby FAIR is the acronym for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And what that means is data should, should be documented properly with information that makes them findable. It's the structure needs to be such that on the internet search engines can find the data, that they have clear licenses, that they are identified in a unique and persistent way so they can be cited just like a publication can, and that there is enough documentation provided with the data to um, allow proper evaluation to know what uncertainties are, what methods have been applied, um, and what data manipulation uh, methodologies. So this has actually in the last year, year and a half, led to new author guidelines by certain publishers. Uh, more are coming on uh, all the time. Uh, Nature and AGU have primarily been leading this movement uh, and for example, um, Nature states as of January 2019, they require that authors of papers in the earth sciences uh, need to make their data available through community repositories. And the same is true for AGU, encouraging authors to submit their data to approved data centers and basically saying AGU reserves the right to refuse publication when authors are unwilling to make the data and other uh, components uh, publicly available. So that's sort of the landscape that I wanted to set uh, about this. And uh, in the last slide, I just showed that the publishers talk about um, community rep uh, repositories or public repositories and that obviously becomes a, a big um, concern. What are the community repositories? Can a database on my website be a repository or not? So uh, there have been a lot of efforts going on to uh, identify criteria for data repositories to comply with the FAIR data principles. And, uh, this has even led to the US government putting out a request for public comments on desired characteristics of repositories and, and so on. So if you're interested in more on this topic, uh, the COPTIS website, uh, COPTIS stands for the Coalition for Publishing Data in the Earth and Space Sciences, um, has a lot of information on this enabling fair data project that uh, was led actually by AGU. Uh, so please go there and check out more information. 
So with that, um, we are going to head to uh, showing you a little bit of information about EarthCam uh, and other systems that are operated at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory as part of the Geoinformatics Group. Uh, so I'm going to show uh, you the three systems that you may be interested in EarthCam. and mineralogical data of terrestrial samples and it also hosts the library for experimental phase relations and the trace, D, um, trace element partition coefficient database that uh, Mark Yorso and Roger Nielsen Gocho Stunisek have uh, been working on and are maintaining right now. Uh, the Astro Material Data System is a new system that is still under development. It, the development started a year ago uh, and it uh, builds an infrastructure for the geochemical, geochronological, and mineralogical data for astro materials that are curated in collections held at the Johnson Space Center of NASA. But it will accommodate any data for astro materials that are submitted to the system. And the third uh, is CESA, the System for Earth Sample Registration, which uh, is a catalog of metadata of information about Earth, space, and environmental samples, uh, and is part of the IGSN infrastructure, which is uh, the IGSN global sample number, a unique and persistent identifier for samples that has a lot of benefits in linking data, publications, and samples, and ensuring, uh, you know, long-term access to information about samples. Uh, so, what are the services that these systems uh, provide? Uh, EarthChem and Astromat have, on the one hand, uh, repository services where data uh, that is submitted by users can be published and uh, archived. But then we also maintain uh, compilations of data, the EarthCam synthesis, many of you might know it under the name of PetDB still, uh, but as the, its content is broadening, we are naming it now the EarthCam synthesis and the ESPRO database. These are um, databases where Individ individual values from larger data sets can be extracted where users can actually uh, generate their own customized data set sets for uh, data analysis and uh, further data mining. And then the system of Earth sample registration, as I already said, has the service for sample registration and uh, for uh, users to obtain unique identifiers. Uh, we do the system development, we uh, review and curate contributed data and compile and harmonize already published data into these syntheses. But EarthCam, Astromat, and CESA are also uh, really trying to engage the community in developing best practices, promoting best practices, and that's part uh, or part of that is uh, the workshop today to introduce these systems and basically uh, facilitate uh, discussions around the use of these data uh, in, in research. And we participate in a lot of different national and international initiatives that advance access to research data, standardization of research data management, and so on. So the workflow uh, in these systems is that for data publication and preservation at the EarthCam library and the Astro Materials repository, uh, it's, we, we offer interfaces for users to submit their data and then we curate them. Uh, wherever the data are appropriate, we take them into these uh, syntheses like uh, the EarthCam synthesis, the EarthCam portal, the library of experimental phase relations, and the ASTRO database, um, where curators uh, take data from the literature and put them into this database, but also, as I said, data sets that were submitted uh, to the repositories and that fit the focus of uh, our syntheses. And then we run the EarthCam portal where uh, 
the data that we curate in the EarthCam synthesis, but also data from external databases, such as the German GeoRock database, the USGS uh, geochemic, National Geochemical Database, and other databases such as the Darwin database, uh, which is run in Japan, um, are all included in a large index that can be searched and accessed. Um, for access, we have primarily so far offered search uh, interfaces as uh, graphical user interfaces on the web. But increasingly, we have set up REST services and we are in the process of developing a new API-driven infrastructure for EarthCam and Aspromat so that uh, you can use these, uh, the data holdings actually through your own code directly. So with that, I'm actually handing over uh, the presentation to Lucy Profita, who is data curator uh, for uh, the EarthCam systems, primarily for the EarthCam library, and to talk about data access at EarthCam and Astromat. Lucy, your floor. Thank you, Kirsten. Let me just go ahead and share my screen then. Can you see it? You're coming. It's coming. Yes. Okay. So, um, as Kristen has said, we have a variety of ways that you can access data. Going from general to specific, you have the EarthCAM portal, which is your one-stop shop to assimilate data from both our systems and external databases, such as GeoRock. You have PetDB, which is the growing EarthCAM synthesis, where uh, there are multiple types of analyses based on rocks, minerals, and inclusions, but all of these are gathered by our curators and put into the synthesis such that you can look at link samples, you can browse by tectonic settings. We'll see a little bit more about that in the following slides. There is the EarthCAM library, which is the repository. You can search for data that has been submitted by other users. You can also access geochronological data, or you can access experimental data in the Library of Experimental Phase Relations. Uh, we have data sets already compiled where uh, on specific sites, such as uh, the Aleutian Arc, you can just view all the data that we have. You don't have to go through the interface. And Lucy, there's also, Lucy, yeah. Lucy can I, um, there are several requests. If you could uh, get into presentation mode. I so think I'm sharing the wrong screen, which is the problem. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me try again. Stop share. So sorry. Otherwise, I, I can just continue with mine. No, I think it's starting now. Is that better? Yes, perfect. So sorry. Thank okay. you. <laughs> the problem with having three screens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, the last one was the Decade Portal, where we have geochemical analyses from multiple databases that are linked directly to individual volcanoes. So this is just a snapshot of the content we have available now. Uh, we have over 4.5 million individual measurements in the EarthCAM synthesis at this time. Uh, these are also compiled within the EarthCAM portal where data is added from multiple databases such as GeoRock and MapDAT. And we are uh, working on releasing the AstroDB where all of the MoonDB data is incorporated, and we also have samples from other types of astro materials. We are working on those lunar samples now, and the next phase will be to insert meteorites. So some of the search interfaces that are available, uh, as I said, the AstroDB is going to be launched soon in the following months. 
where you can search by different filters and uh, get specific specimens, or uh, if you're interested in different types of analyzed materials, you can filter by that. Uh, the ARFCAM portal, where you have um, samples listed either through different databases or setting multiple criteria, such as on a map, or in the PetDB, where you can get all of the ARFCAM samples, either by sample types, chemistry, location, features, and so on. First, you search for your samples, then you select the type of analyses that you're looking at, different materials or variables, and then you can customize and download your data set. So let's go through Decade Portal as well, where you can see for a specific uh, volcano, which you could get through the simplest search, you could go to the data and have things aggregated from the Smithsonian Global Volcanic Program database, from the EarthCAM library, from the portal, if there are samples registered for CSAR, or for the um, volcanic gases. In the EarthCAM portal, this is what it would look like if you would be searching for a specific feature. You can do um, map searches. You can do chemistry searches. You can select different keywords or if you're interested in specific references or looking up samples either by their cruise IDs or IGSNs if they have those. So IGSNs would be specific numbers that are unique to that sample registered for CSAR or other allocating agents. And after you decide which of the samples you'd like to download, you can customize your download to include different types of uh, measurements, be it major oxides, noble gases, rare earth elements, whatever you're interested in. And you can select what kind of samples you are interested in. So only the ones that have the values or all of them, and you can group them with methods and unions so that you're comparing apples to apples. <laughs> Once you have customized your download, you can view your sample list and you can get to details of specific samples. You also have links to experiments that might have been um, comparable in composition to what variables you got for those samples. And you can search for similar samples if uh, there are such samples with compositions that are similar. I would just like to make a note that in the user interface, like you've seen before, if you have less than 50,000 samples in your download, you can access them either through Excel or through CSVs. And if you have up to 200,000 samples, you will only be able to do so for the CSVs. Uh, we're in the process of developing a new API-driven architecture so that you would get faster downloads even through the user interface. And we're working on a Jupyter Hub for EarthCAM, uh, which will be released in 2021. We also uh, got funded to collaborate with the Enki project, um, which Mark Yerso is the principal investigator. And that's going to integrate the data from EarthCAM with um, experiments provided on the Enki platform. In the meantime, you can use our REST API services if you'd like to perform large downloads for data science. Uh, in the slides, you can find some links to the specific uh, APIs. It works with uh, get string variables. So you can go to uh, the documentation link to follow up on what type of searches you can do. There are also examples there to get you started. And this would be much faster than the download through the uh, user interface. I also put up a few resources for you. Uh, if you would like a fast tutorial into Python and using APIs through Python so that you get the calls directly through there, or um, an example done through PyData with EarthCAM data from Jesse Robertson. Some other nice resources, if you're not very familiar with Python, would be this introduction to Jupyter Notebooks in Python that was done by our colleague Kelsey Markey two years ago for Goldschmidt. And a very nice um, primer course of Python programming for Earth Science students uh, that was created by Lisa Talks and her um, 
collaborators at UCSD. So with that, I think I'll hand it back to Kristen. If I can stop sharing my screen. <laughs> there we go. All right. Let's get to your, let's get back to it. Oh, now I have to jump through all your slides <laughs> briefly. Uh, and get Okay, we'll edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now I'm too fast. All right. So we want a happy data scientist who has all the data in the world. And even though it looks like EarthCam has a huge number of data, and that's really true. I mean, being able to search through chemical data for over a million samples is, is pretty substantial. It still is only a fraction of all the geochemistry that's available in the world and that's, uh, that has been pr produced and that will be produced in the future. So I want to take these last 10 minutes of the presentation uh, to encourage everybody, think about sharing their data. You, if we can all contribute to these data resources worldwide, we will all be able to do more exciting science. So please share your data. And what I'm going to do is uh, just give you a quick guide of how to do that uh, with the EarthCAM library. The EarthCAM library, as I mentioned already before, is a data repository that publishes and archives user-contributed data. They can be geochemical, petrological, geochronological. Um, we, we will always um, take a look at the data. We do actively curate this data, do a review of the data, and would tell you if the data are not appropriate for our system. But our goal really is to help researchers make their data fair, make the data findable for others and accessible, but also uh, make sure that these data can be integrated into larger uh, collections of data, so become interoperable, and that we make them reusable by making sure that the data have all the information necessary about the, the provenance of the data, data manipulation, and so on. So uh, we do follow international best practices for data repositories. We provide guidelines and help for users to document their data, the provenance and quality. Um, our curators, such as Lucy, who just uh, spoke, they review these submissions. Uh, when a uh, submission is approved in having all the necessary metadata, uh, we register them with the DOI so the data becomes citable. And many publishers will ask you to include the DOI of your data set in the publication. So you will see that when you are trying to submit uh, manuscripts uh, increasingly. Uh, we also make sure that the data are archived for long-term access, and we do that in Amazon Glacier right now. Uh, and an interesting, um, really powerful aspect of the way we uh, handle the data is that we're linking the data to the publications. We're linking them to the samples, to funding awards, uh, to orchids of the authors and so on. So it builds a network of information that can be used in many different ways. And again, we are trying to increase uh, machine readable interfaces where metadata about the data sets can be discovered uh, by other data portals or by commercial search engines. Um, EarthCAM, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's following international best practices and as such it is recommended by publishers showing here nature uh, as, you know, one of two uh, repositories that nature recommends for biogeochemistry and geochemical data. Uh, we accept a wide range of data types, mainly um, sample-based data, but we do have time series measurements and so on. 
Uh, most of the data we have are chemical physical properties of different materials, uh, experimental data, be they kinetic, thermodynamic experiments, and so on. Uh, and we do have sample descriptions as well. So it's, it's pretty broad. Uh, and it is new data that uh, are published in the literature, but then also data sets that are compiled in part from databases like the EarthCam synthesis or GeoRock and so on, uh, where people have uh, written papers about um, these big compilations about syntheses. I mean, the work that Brennan has done um, has data sets that also should be recorded so that the results are reproducible. We have published a few method descriptions uh, and we're trying to figure out uh, how to also include models and software. Uh, this is part of the new project that uh, Lucy mentioned already where we're working with Enki to uh, build a closer integration of models and, and data. Um, so we have um, a range of services for you that make it easier uh, to submit data to us. We have an online submission form that uh, you can use to put in the uh, bibliographic metadata for your data set. Uh, you can use templates that we make available to put together all the right um, information about data provenance, about uncertainties, and so on. You can access your submissions or even you can save uh, when you don't manage to finish a submission, you can save it. That is all accessible uh, via your own uh, dashboard in the system. And we deliver uh, twice a year a report and how many downloads, uh, how many times your data set has been downloaded. And clearly we're always there with user support to answer any questions and help uh, if there are any problems. Um, we are in the process of uh, making some substantial changes to our data submission process. Uh, and uh, a really important one is that we are implementing uh, data communities. This is if you have a special community such as, you know, everybody working with Tefra data. We had requests from a community that was doing clumped isotope measurements. They wanted, they suggested best practices, how to document cl clumped isotope measurements and so on. Uh, we are creating these as communities with a web page where you can post templates or post a description of best practices and so on, and also have a customized uh, data submission form and potentially the communities can be searched individually through the ECL search. We're closely integrating with the Astromaterial Repository because the EarthCam library has already received a number uh, of data sets for lunar samples and for meteorites. Okay, um, this is just uh, a brief screenshot of uh, the data submission form where you can go and you can see when you log in, your name is already recorded. You can link the funding sources, provide a data set title and so on. I don't need to go deeper into that. We have a lot of uh, help resources, online tutorials, YouTube videos uh, to show you how to go through the process. Uh, these best practices, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, are based on uh, a, an effort uh, where publishers and data facilities in, the geo, geo, in geochemistry got together uh, in sort of 2008, 2009, and uh, agreed on recommendations for best practices. Um, they were called the Editor's Roundtable. And this is what we have implemented as best practices for the EarthCam library. Uh, we only accept tabular data. It, if there are tabular data, they have to be in CSV or uh, in Excel format or text format, but no PDFs or documents or PNGs or whatever. Um, there needs to be uh, a rich set of metadata uh, at a minimum sample location, sample type, 
um, the technique that was used, is it, was it done by mass spectrometry, was it done by XRF and so on, and in which lab were the data created. Obviously units, uncertainty if, if possible, standard measurements and so on. Um, if it is a compilation, we are uh, asking for a full list of all the data sources uh, so that um, people can, uh, can get credit for the data they have contributed to these databases. And clearly avoiding abbreviations is critical for the long-term use uh, if nobody knows what uh, ABC on your in your column heading means, then uh, that makes a data set pretty um, unusable. This is just a, a landing page for one of the data sets uh, that we received. Uh, one, um, one thing I wanted to point to here is this is a data set that is not yet available. So when you submit your data, uh, you can set a release date uh, up to two years, oops, up to two years into the future. Link to the funding source that takes you directly to the funding agency's landing page of the award if that exists. Uh, and we also um, encourage the use of the IGSN and if a data set has uh, or refers to samples by IGSN, we include them in the metadata record. for a specific sample. Uh, and the IGSN then links to the landing page uh, at CISA at the System for Earth Sample Registration that shows you the information about the sample. It also shows, if provided by the user who, sub who registered that sample, it shows where this sample is curated. In this case here, uh, the sample is at the Marine Geological Samples Laboratory at the University of Rhode Island. So you can contact that uh, repository, sample repository, if you are interested in further working on the, that sample. So just uh, at the end, some additional advice when you manage your data. Uh, the submission is something that happens at uh, fairly late in the life of data. It is good to think about how you will manage your data, what, how you will share that data, at the very beginning of a project. And funding agencies in many countries are already requesting data management plans. So when you start a project, think you know what data you will acquire, how much it will be, clarify with your collaborators who is responsible for which data and what licenses uh, fit everybody's uh, constraints in some way. Uh, identify the data repository and check what you are supposed to provide in the end so that you can start gathering any relevant metadata while you're acquiring the data and not, uh, you know, you have to, to find that metadata um, years after you acquired the data, which is sometimes quite, uh, quite challenging. And, register your samples early when you have collected them so you have the IGSN and you can keep it on your sample label and on your sample vials in the lab and you can always track that sample through its, through its life. Uh, we have been engaged with a project to build a data management plan tool. It's called EasyDMP. Uh, so if you want to use that, uh, we definitely recommend that. And just as final thoughts here, um, one thing that makes it so difficult for efforts like EarthChem to get enough data, to get more data into these syntheses is that we still are lacking um, international standards for these type of analytical data to be able to automate data ingestion and to rapidly grow and also network extend available data collections in the world. So we, we realize that many of the data systems we have need uh, an urgent technical upgrade and architectures. Um, 
And many of these databases are also challenged with sustainability. They don't have a long-term uh, funding model that, um, that ensures their data resources and their services will be available in the long term. So what we've been trying to work on with some international partners is the development of a global network for geochemical data providers. And I just wanted to point uh, to one geochemistry where EarthChem has come together with colleagues in Australia uh, who have built the Oscope geochemistry network and the European Plate Observing System Multiscale Laboratories to start building this network. So if you are affiliated with any other program, institution, organization that would like to participate in this effort, uh, please contact either myself or Leslie Wyburn. Uh, and I can point you also to a presentation that will happen at this Goldschmidt Virtual Conference uh, on June 25, unfortunately at a very uh, challenging time at 1.45 a.m. Uh, on the East Coast here, but many of you are in other time zones uh, where it will be much easier to participate in this. So with that, again, questions into the chat. And um, we will otherwise um, soon move on to to the third session and I will actually get out of this so I can see what other what questions might have come in already. Lucy, Shauna, I don't know if there's anything. We've got a couple you... questions that have come in, Kirsten. Um, okay. First of all, thank you for your presentation. And yeah, for anyone who's on the line right now, I think our next session starts at is it twelve thirty? Is that right, Kirsten? Uh, the next um, one starts at twelve fifteen. 15. Okay. Um, great. So the first question that we had was um, really around whether or not there was petrological and microscopic data associated with the data in the EarthChem and AIDA systems. Um, n not really. Um, I, the only system I know that provides um, images is the open microscope that has um, a very cool system for viewing thin sections online, but they are limited to lunar samples as far as I'm aware. Uh, several data systems for uh, the, the astro materials have huge collections of images, uh, but so far um, it is primarily at the site of uh, the repository, the databases of data repositories uh, often store images. A fantastic one is the um, database of the US Polar Rock Repository that has very well documented samples with lots of images. Um, so it is unfortunately random and again would be a great thing to do by building uh, better networks uh, to to link to those images where they are available. Great, thank you, Kirsten. Um, and then we had a couple other questions. Uh, the next one was um, from Justin Buck, and that was, um, which is the best or recommend, which, what are the best practices essentially for assigning PIDs or DOIs to um, a data for specific samples. To, to what, sorry. I... Basically DO, data DOIs. Oh, data DOIs. I mean, that's done when you submit um, to any repository that is recommended, they will assign DOIs. Uh, that is standard best practice uh, for recommended repositories. Great. And also, and, and kind of I mean, on... when, when it comes to, I should just add the best practices around that are primarily, you know, at what level of granularity do you assign DOIs? So when we get submissions and there are multiple data tables, uh, they are all combined as one data set that has one DOI. That might change in the future, but that is currently uh, the EarthChem library practice. 
And there is another practice pertains to versions. So if you need to make changes to a data set that has already been published and has a DOI, it is a new version that gets a different DOI, though it gets linked to the original submission. Great, thank you. And the add-on question to that was, is it possible to cite a subset or, or versions, which I think you've more or less answered at this point? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, it's, it's a consideration uh, that we're doing right now if we should assign DOIs to each individual data table of a data set. Uh, there are many discussions going on right now uh, in other communities as well, especially those that have continuous measurements and need DOIs for just subsets of those measurements uh, and how to, to treat that uh, in, in citations and if you can um, basically assign a collection DOI as uh, with, with multiple uh, child DOIs under it and so on. So there's a lot of discussion and I think there may be changes uh, to allow the more focused citation of data. Great, thank you. And in the chat, um, Michael Howe was kind enough to uh, give a link to, it looks like oh. the British Geological Survey has uh, yeah. 160,000 thin sections online. That's pretty neat. Thank you very much for- That's for fantastic, that. Mike. Thank you. Yeah. And um, so I, I had a general question, if you don't mind, Kirsten. I think we have Fair a few enough. more. Um, so how, so often what I do in my work, and I think a fair number of people who, you know, like when we just saw, saw Brennan doing his talk, we're often taking a lot of different data sets, say from EarthCam or somewhere else that might yeah. provide a DOI for the original data set. And we're often, you know, kind of doing a lot of curation to our individual database. So, right, we, we've kind of made our own database and we've changed it and we've done a lot of things to it that are very specific to our paper or our project. And we make these things available in the supplements of our papers usually. But I've also seen that this can be be given a DOI of its own. Yes, and that absolutely. I'm having a little bit of trouble wrapping my head around that and how attribution in that case is properly given to the original creator of the data. I know that's not a very specific question, but could you maybe speak to that? Yeah, a bit? It's it's a challenge that we've been talking about in in our world since these GeoRock PetDB databases uh, were released, where authors were unhappy that basically the citation then went to PetDB or to GeoRock or EarthCam and not to their original publication. Um, this is being solved by integrating all these original citations into the metadata of the data set so that you know, large um, service providers such as Crossref who build these indexes of citations and so on can have access to all the citations for a given data set. It is not yet there. This is in design phases and being discussed about in, in the research data community quite a bit, but it is technically solvable. It is just a large scale change for the publishers and for these providers like Crossref. Uh, so I hope that it will be possible in the future to do this easily. Right now, it's not that easy. So as I said, what, you know, with EarthCam, when we get a compilation from somebody who used PetDB, we want a complete list of all the original publications that had contributed to that data set. Now that's very hard to, to check, but at least we, we take a look and say, you must have that list and uh, usually people have provided it. Great, yeah, that's kind of what I've been doing to this point, but I think at some point that becomes cumbersome, right? When you've got 100,000, you know, 100,000 individual uh, data sources, it gets problematic. So what I'm hearing basically is that there's people are working on a kind of an almost like a nested uh, citation. Yeah, right? it's like yeah, included yeah. Within. Okay, that's really exciting. Thank you. That's a question I've been struggling with. So it looks like Lucy handled a question online. Um, the question was, 
um, that it's, it's clear how to submit um, some of the very common and standard uh, geochronological uh, data, uranium, lead, argon, argon. But the question was how to submit um, geochron data such as uh, samarium neodymium, which is not presented in uh, the data template. And uh, Lucy responded that um, you can use the bulk isotope analyses data submission template. And she gave the link there. It's uh, earthchem.org forward slash data forward slash templates. And you can submit it there via the earthchem.org library. And now my question about this, um, maybe for Lucy or Kirsten would be, does this end up in the same place as the rest of the geochronological data or does this end up in like a supplementary file or how, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, what, what Lucy proposed here, that would be a submission to the EarthChem library. That's where that data set would get a DOI and can be cited in the paper that you write about those age data. Uh, Geochron um, is a slightly different system. Geochron was originally built to uh, allow people to preserve their data in a common catalog, but was not meant for data publication. It doesn't assign a DOI uh, to, to the data and ensures the long-term archiving. I think they're working on that, but right now, uh, Geochron basically um, points users to the EarthChem library when they want to make their data public and says, if you want to publish this now, send your data to the EarthChem library so that it, it becomes citable and long-term archived. Uh, we, have, we have worked with Geochron also to build the Lunar Geochron. And for the Lunar Geochron, we already have Samarium, Neodymium, and Rubidium, Strontium templates. So I hope that the Geochron group, who works differently, this is headed by Doug Walker at the University of Kansas, uh, I will let them know that there is interest um, to, from, from users to submit the rubidium sponsium uh, samarium neodymium data and that they should include scripts to upload that data into the Geochron system as well. Great, thank you so much. I, and, I, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, I noticed that it's already eight minutes past the hour. <laughs> It is. So actually, we, we can be in here until 12.15, and our next session doesn't start until uh, I just need to launch the next session. That's my challenge, I think. Yep. I'm not so, sure. So um, great. So we're going to post this up on the Discord. And so if there are any further questions on there, we can uh, definitely address them there. So please uh, check that out. That should come in an email um, after the end of the session. So our next session, I hope you all will join us for, is going to be geochemistry through space and time with the spatio-temporal -tempor weighted regression model um, with Dr. Marshall Ma, Chow Ma, and Xiang Chi uh, from the University of Idaho. So um, we're going to start that up at 1230. So please join us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.